Ladies and gentlemen, it's bloody late here in the UK, mostly because I cocked up the time. And it's very early in Australia. Ryan Bowen there sat in his truck early morning. What time is it, mate, now? Is it actually 7 o'clock now? The seven real 7. The real 7 a.m. <laughs> That's how we treat Australians, son. <laughs> All this lying garbage. Even though you're not working... And COVID-19 has shut down the entire globe. <laughs> Get your ass out of bed, you Aussie stood. And we got two of them out. Two of them out of bed. That's two wins for the Brits. And we've got two of them on this call. My fine fat self. Also, Tom the Lean Machine Holland. We've got Jordan <laughs> Davis. <laughs> Amazingly, Jordan. First time I've ever seen you. Look like you've not literally just done a line of crack. <laughs> waiting for it to kick in mate waiting for it to kick and in you're, you're not supposed to do that but <laughs> the, other, the other guy on the call familiar face it's Ryan Blue Bowen now then bud how's, how's, how's your life in the truck well man, it's, man everything's good I have to say Neil normally you're the one that make jokes about the size of appendages but I think with these two long, lanky bastards here, you and me, Neil, we're probably we're probably coming third and fourth somewhere here. <laughs> I don't know what you've been told, son, but um, I've got the temperature ramped up in here, and to be perfectly honest, hell yeah. <laughs> no, no, hey, Jordan, you've been spending too many hours in a room with that boy. That's all I'm going to oh, say. <laughs> this all so, go down. He's... Bigging you, he doesn't mind bigging you up, does he? All right, no, he doesn't at all. He doesn't not at all. <laughs> He's giving it to you. But well, guys, <laughs> welcome, welcome to the show. And I, I thought I'd get you all together, um, just to just to chat things through. There's been a little bit of this going on online. Um, I think it started a video you put you put out, Ryan, where you were uh, talking about Jordan and Jordan's potential, and. Yeah. Um, the possibility that Jordan will now move up in weight class. Because yeah. for those of you who aren't familiar with these two guys, if you're new to this channel, if you're new to arm wrestling and any Orion stuff, because you would have seen uh, Jordan on there. He's obviously tagged as skinny guy. We've also got Tom Holland on the phone, who's literally the slimmest arm wrestler since Kevin Bongard. Both these guys are very, very similar build. I mean, if these guys are painted green and show up at a fancy dress party... Let me tell you now, most people are thinking grass, not Hulk. <laughs> and that but, is a yeah. I was thinking yeah. of fence piling, mate, but... Um... <laughs> but honestly, these two both both are one of the, the most or, unique arm wrestles out there in, in, the, in the biomechanical sense. Um, and I know for, forever, Jordan and I have talked about a match between him and Tom would be fascinating. Um, and I think I met Tom, what, Armour's 2014. How long have you been pulling Tom at that stage? Were you, you were, what, third year or something? That was a baby yeah. Tom. No, it, baby Tom, that wasn't it, mate? Yeah, I was about five years in at that time. Okay. Tom, was right, that your I'm... second ever Armour's? Yeah, I've done the first one in the XL. No, I've done yeah. the Traffic Centre, 2008. And, and at the one Ryan came to. I was 2014. 2014. So did you pull Ted Wilson there? Yeah, that was Ted. One thing I remember from that was I remember Tom, I remember you getting on the on the microphone and, and, and saying to the crowd afterwards that your goal was nothing short of the world's best. Um, and so it doesn't surprise me when I see kind of what, You've done, Tom, and then Jordan, a different story, comes along a bit later, but has had the the rapid rise of, of truly dedicated and truly um, efficient arm wrestling training. And I think I think the time's right now where these two throwing down would be amazing. I don't know what the weight story is with you, Tom, at the moment, but how I'm are you about still... About 81 at the minute. What are you? About 81 kilo at the minute. 81, about okay. Between 80 81. There's Round about the heaviest I've been. I'm usually about 77, 78. What about you, Jordan? Mate, that is ridiculous. How you're managing to stay that low? Well, I don't even know. I've been eating loads of chocolate as well. Dogs attacking me. 
and and <laughs> Tom, you stand at, for for those who don't know, Tom stands between six three six four, so he's yeah, a very he's tall, six. yeah, a tall rangy guy. What? How tall are you, Jordan? Uh, just short of six four. Yeah, so yeah. almost same, almost the same physical stats, basically. Very different yeah. stylistically, but almost the the same. The other, you know, the other parallel is this that Tom and Tom's entire upbringing was on the arm wrestling table. It's only more recently that you've, you've seen Tom get into supplementation through gym work. Prior to that, Tom was the kid that didn't say a goddamn thing, but never got off the practice table. I, I remember one particular tournament we went to, it was the European Championships in Frederikstad, yeah, Norway. I kid you not, I honestly believe that that is the most consecutive arm wrestling matches that I've ever seen any individual human being have in my life. He, he arm wrestled from the beginning of the European Championship right arm to the end of the after party at the European Championship right arm. Literally. So he's so at the table. The competition. Unreal. So he's at the tournament, straight on the table, straight on the practice table. Um... From there, I was going against all the Russians. That um, remember PAF Branders? Yep, yep. God so rest his soul. Yep. Uh, yeah, literally a good four or five days, weren't it? Just start to finish, start whenever I could. Now that uh, was a pretty similar story with Jordan. From what you were saying, right, and all your sort of upbringing in the sport, mate, has been from a table, table, table perspective. That's sort of the ethos that you follow, yeah. Yeah. You go, Jordan. Oh, we've lost your you've lost your sound somehow, Jordan. Either that or you're a hell of a mime artist. That? There we go. You're back. Alright, alright. Yep, yep, yep. Nice work. <laughs> no, Ryan and I spent um what must have been close to four years doing just table time, two and a half, three hours a night. Um yeah, for that whole period just at sixty percent, um, training what we could. Uh, learning, developing on the table as, as often as we could. And, you know, once a week or twice a week, we'd have maybe interact with other arm wrestlers for about the same amount of time. But other than that, it was just us on the table. And, yeah. <coughs> we, we took the approach of trying to... We, we acknowledged that the little things matter most. And we, we, we believed, honestly, that we were both coming from a place where we were weak. We were weaker than everyone we were chasing. And we, we saw the fastest way to, to surpass all those guys above us wasn't to get strong in a broad sense, in a base level sense. We thought that was going to take too long. We wanted to get strong in the little tiny things that are going to disengage our opponents from access to power. And still to this day, the people that I'm balanced with, and I know the people that Jordan's balanced with, are still way physically stronger than, than me and or Jordan. Um, so that, 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 the, the carryover of that period of training in, in, our, in our journey is still at the forefront, and um, and and that's why that's why I think I'm a good super match puller. That's why Jordan's a good super match puller. Um, those little things add up so much when someone starts getting tired, and um, yeah, that's that's really where it all came from for us. Neil, we've lost you now, Neil. Yep. What's going on with these gremlins? Have you got me now or no? <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll pick up where I was going to go there. Obviously, I agree with 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 everything you said there. Particularly, I'm going to make two points. Firstly, the, the the thing you said there about the little things matter. That is almost exactly what I said to my missus on our wedding night as she cried herself to sleep. <laughs> the second important thing there is that I do think that if you're going to be good at playing tennis play tennis. If you're going to be good at boxing, box. If you're going to be good at rally driving, drive cars through forests. And if you're going to be good at arm wrestling, get on the goddamn table. It, it really yeah. does make a difference. I wanted to question you on one thing, though, guys. <clears throat> and I mean this with the greatest respect. I know, obviously, you put on there to make that point. Most of it was to make the point, obviously, that Jordan reminded you and has been spoken about as a, like a miniature Devon Larratt. I'm mm. going to say I don't agree with that comment. Okay. I think actually Tom is a lot nearer to a miniature Devon Larratt because of the style. The strength through the elbow 
If you looked at Devon's early days, he was more of an inside arm wrestler than a top yeah. roller, where Jordan's all top roll. I'm going to say okay. that this guy's more like Vitali La Latin. Okay, I, 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 I disagree with you, Neil. <laughs> uh, the reason I disagree with you, Neil, is um, I, I believe Devon was a, 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 an inside defender and an outside uh, attacker, ultimately, in his early days. Um, he would any time he was in a legit match, he would go inside because he didn't have the ability to just go outside straight away. And often he, he would get control of all the matches inside. But I, I have heard Devin describe himself as an outside attacker in his early days. J- Jordan Jordan has an enormous offense, and when 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 he's pulled people down here in Australia, um, yes, the, the, the top roll is is the clear and obvious weapon that he chooses most often, but. But I, I know very well in a super match, like if I was to face Jordan in a super match, he's going to be coiled as hell and, and, and putting the brakes on me with an inside stop. He, I, if Jordan tries to take shoulder line position on me, I can't stop him from doing it. He can bully my shoulder line out of the way, just like I would expect Tom to attempt to as well. Um, so I just think we haven't seen, we just haven't seen it because Jordan hasn't had the opponent that he's had to do it against yet. That's all. It's there. It's wait. It's, trust me, it's there. So, Our oh, difference of opinion remains to be proven, and I'm sure it will be as time goes on, and you can pay me the money then. But <laughs> <laughs> up until that time, um, what I was basing it on, really, guys, is that Jordan's natural power, Jordan's yeah. natural strength, doesn't seem to me, from what I've seen of the guy, and, and obviously you know him far, far better than I do, but it doesn't seem that he gravitates towards joint strength. It doesn't seem that he gravitates towards the inside techniques in, in arm wrestling. Now, I understand what you're saying from a sort of technical perspective, the way that he feels matches, and I get that entirely, and I'd agree with that. I'd endorse that 100%. What I'm getting at, really, was that what Devon pictured himself as and what Devon really was, trust me, are two yeah. different things. And for yeah. evidence of that, you only need to watch the man arm wrestle. In his early days, when he was against real world-class arm wrestlers who were real world-class top rollers, and I mean world-class, case in point, Ivakin Taras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I saw that match in my mind, when I brought those two guys together, firstly, um, when I suggested that match, I got laughed at. People said, you are kidding me. We're going to bring Taras against this unknown Canadian guy. And I said, trust me, this guy's real. And if he loses his wrist and hand, it won't matter because he can pull with his wrist back and he's rock strong. That's where his strength is. He looks like a top roller, but all his power, his real strength is on the inside. And to this day, joint damage aside, that is where the real strength of Devon Larratt is. Trust me yeah. on that. Yeah. If you look at the Devon Larratt John Brzezink match in the yeah. World Art Wrestling yeah. League, remember John's comment: "Don't go inside with Devon Larratt. That is uh, not Jordan." Yeah. And I'm going to make a similar yeah. comparison here. Tom yeah. is much stronger inside than outside, and yeah. he's lost many of his matches because he. Went inside when he should have top rolled. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, yeah. well, Jordan and Tom, you guys are the opposites because Jordan's lost matches where he's tried to go outside where he should have just come inside and been in control. Um, so yeah, it, it, I, I I do agree. See what you're saying, Neil, and I, and I do I do get the point, and I, and I agree. But I, I guess there. Um, uh, yeah, just match him up already, would you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Question for you, Tom. Yeah, mate. Um, uh, so, how, what do you think made you into that that out and out hooker that you've become? Like, you know, it's it's interesting for me because you know I I know what's made me the top roller that I am. You know, um, you know I had a really weak wrist, and despite that, I ended up top rolling anyway. Um, so so what made you that that really out and out hooker honestly it's um i was always top rolling as well well i've always been like an all-rounder sort of thing but mainly top roll um yeah then it got to a point with craig sanders um i tried everything else with him tried top rolling him tried side pressure if nothing worked then yeah. i got to the um wr qualifiers 
Um, the first one, the British qualifiers. And um, yeah, literally the only thing I could do then was just try going inside with him. As soon as that worked, that was it. I started dedicating to it. Um, sort of got hooked on that a bit too much, so and started forgetting <laughs> about the problem. That's the problem. I had it before with. Um, remember that match against Clydus? Yes. Yeah. Um, he beat me inside, whereas uh, that was the first day I got an injury, actually. Very first day on that European qualifier. Mm hmm. And then um, you come up to me, you said, Tom, it's not illegal to top roll. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, shit. Mm. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, soon after that, I started top rolling again. And, yeah, I just need to not be stubborn. I need to stay away from the hook for a little bit. Um, it, it, it's interesting, isn't it? We were talking about this the other day, myself and Ryan on the show. And we talked about the cock of the walk. And we talked about Rob Vigent Jr.'s claim about the sort of, you know, the triple crown, if you can hook, if you can press, if you can top roll, and you do it in one event. And we were saying that it takes balls. And people, and a, a lot of arm wrestlers, even the very, very best arm wrestlers, again, let's make a reference point here. Michael Todd, Devin Larratt, both men, okay? Two of the very best in the world. Two very technical pullers as well. Let me tell you now, everybody thinks that Michael Todd's a one-trick pony. No, 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 no. Dude can do it all. Does he do it all? No. Even when he's able to, he doesn't. Devon Larratt, if he's in any kind of pressure match, I'm talking about a match where he's not extremely confident to win, he will ordinarily, on the right arm, run to the Kings because he knows it's his most lethal weapon against 99% of people. But you don't see him use that arsenal the same. And I'm going to make another reference here with Devon, which we've spoken about a lot when it's just me and him on the phone. Devon that came over to pull John Brzezink in the famous changing of the guard match at deep water was an entirely different individual because at that time he was the hunter, not the hunted. He was okay. the guy that was chasing. So he was hitting people and then he was attacking. Then he was top rolling to attack people. <clears throat> Same situation as when he pulled Ron Bath at the Trafford Centre. You wind the clock forward and he gets to that superior level of top end and everybody at the High Hookers Club and everywhere he goes, he's developing his strength, he's developing his game by letting people initiate on him. And so all his matches, I'm here, I'm here, that's where I am. And he spent so long there that he sort of lost that, that, that razor edge to attack. And I think yeah. that's a problem for a lot of arm wrestlers, to be honest. You can become... Because... Building your game through defence with a lot of people, if you've got a very wide club like the Brisbane heavy hitters there, it's a great place to go and soak up the talent. And by doing so, you push your level up. Your your well-roundedness goes up, your strength goes up. But it's very, very hard not to lose that, that, that edge, that sharp edge. So I think it's important that you box off an element of your training where you work on just savagery, just brutal attack. Uh, well, N Neil, I, I agree totally, and um, I I do think that the style is very much shaped by the person you're chasing most. Um, I I didn't have a hook at all until Jordan surpassed me as a top roller, and then once he surpassed me as a top roller, I thought, well, shit, I got to learn to to pull inside, and that was a few years ago. Um, and and I'm sure Jordan has had similar similar reasons for why he's gone the way and and. Tom mentioning Craig Sanders is the reason why he he hooked. Um, it, it makes sense. And then the next person in the story that you're chasing, it often shapes what you're going to become as well. Uh, I, I I also agree with the the not not allocating the ability to attack um, is something that I I haven't I haven't trained an all in out attack in a long time, and I've, I've subsequently become quite a a defender, a generic defender, um, which is interesting. But I will say of Jordan that. When he uh, competes and he actually cares, he's got one of the most savage attacks I've ever felt. Like it's it's mm -hmm. it's friggin' horrible. I there is no one worse in Australia for me to try to absorb or ready go from than a than a fired up Jordan. <laughs> it's, it's horrible. It's dead seriously nasty. And the fascinating thing about how I see the match with Tom and Jordan would be that if these two guys these two guys are so used to being 
the lanky guy, the tall guy, and they're very used to the ratios of dealing with shorter people. Um, obviously, Tom can usually reach over and grab a hook, no worries. Jordan can be way too tall and top roll, no worries. But with both of these guys all of a sudden being on a level playing field when it comes to elbow to fingertip, I think for both of you guys, it's going to feel weird that you can't do what you normally do. And uh, I like to me, that's why it's just one of those beautiful matches that I'd love to see. But yeah, I think we can sort of dissect that a bit further. Jordan, your question to Tom about why are you um, so strong in the hook or where did he gravitate towards that? I'm going to also yeah. say that Tom's physical statistics in terms of forearm length, hand size, and so on, are not exceptional for his height. But well, it sounds to me like yours are. Yeah. yeah so he's absolutely. got a shorter lever on a longer frame. Mm. Yeah, I've, think... I've got um, I've got a longer um, arm, arm width than my height. So mm -hmm. um, at 6'3", I think um, I was like 10 cents. 10 centimetres um, longer in my arm width than I was in my height. So, um, yeah, whatever that is on the ape index type thing. See, like six dicks on the ape just, index. Just one point, sorry to jump in there, guys, but what the fluff made that noise in the background in Australia? Because I don't know what kind of bird that was, right? <laughs> what was that? It was a magpie at Jordan's house. <laughs> yeah. Is that a magpie? That's yeah. a weird ass magpie noise. That's a, last time I heard a noise like that, I'm sure it came out of something that spat like acid <laughs> on Jurassic Park. <laughs> Didn't know whether you had them. Because yeah. I know you got bad. A magpie will rip your ear off. It'll, it'll yeah. swoop you and rip your ear off. Clean off. Clean yeah. off. Clean off. Australia, <laughs> terrible place. Sharks, <laughs> biggest sharks in the world. Got them. Tick. Crocodile, got them. Uh, Spiders. Yeah. Really bad. Snakes. I got my feet off the ground for a reason. <laughs> why? You can't go to the toilet. You do. You got to put the friggin' lid up because anything be under there. Snakes. <laughs> they're knocking about everywhere and apparently yeah. in Jordan shorts and, <laughs> and drop bears. Yeah. <laughs> uh, drop bears. Drop bears yeah. are terrible. Kill you. Bite your head off. <laughs> oh. You know what? It's not that she can come over here. Oh, yeah. good over there. <laughs> it's beautiful climate, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and apparently lower uh, infection rate on coronavirus, as I understand it. So a thing today. Well it's in Australia, lower infection rate this week. Is that right, or is that just uh, what we've been told? I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? I don't know. I'm an essential worker, so I, I get to work still. So. <laughs> 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 we're gonna we're gonna pull the curtain down on this episode number one but we will be back very soon with part two from these young men so please do not go anywhere and remember if you like what we do share subscribe and like it see you in a minute jordan has time to the snip away get himself popped full of wobbly eggs we'll be right back <laughs> 